So we have basically finished the programming lecture uh, last time, and today we're going to start a new one, but let's just briefly look at our assignment for last time that we were working on. There were some questions. Okay. Yeah. So there was this write a function, my product, with loop that will take a vector x and compute the following product. And n is number of elements in x. If the product is ever larger than 10,000, then you should stop the computation. So I'm actually now go through and solve this. If you solved it last time and you don't want to go through it again, be my guest and work on number four. Okay? So you can now go and work this one. This one will be an interesting while loop. But if not, you can just pay attention to what I'm doing. And I'm going to go through it slowly. So basically, the moment it says write a function, okay, write a function translates to basically new function. Okay? MATLAB is already nice enough to give me sort of things to fill in. Okay? And my function needs input argument, and it said that was that array x, right? It's supposed to be called my product. Okay? And output arguments will be that product that we compute. I'll call it p. Well, actually, I'm going to call it prod, because that also sounds like my last name, almost. So... That's going to be, uh, though, it's, uh, pro, that might be, oh, okay, so, hold on. so, we need, actually, so this is going to be function, I'm going to describe what I'm doing, computes product of type of i times x of i until it reaches 10,000. So this is a very short description of what I'm doing. And what I also like as part of the programming practice is put, actually copy this entire line. Okay. So when I save that, I'm going to save this as my product.n. <laughs> and what this does, so now if I say, uh, what's the point of actually having this comment here? Which this stuff in green. So I will know later. But also, what I can do, what I can do, I can say help my product, and it's going to be printed back at me. Precisely these lines that are in green. So any comment at the very beginning of the function will be printed once you type help. That's how help is programmed. So that's actually nice because I can quickly say help and see how to, so this way I actually see how to run the function, right? And the second line quickly tells me what to do. I can actually keep going and I can say x, x is input array, okay? And product is output product of elements x of i times i summed over. Okay. Or, no, it's a product of all of those elements. All right. So how you organize this part is a little up to you. The nicer you make it, the nicer it is for you later to read it. But as long as you have complete information in there, that should be fine. All right. So now, actually, let me program this. So I can actually do this with both for loop and a while loop. And I'm going uh, to exhibit like how to do both. First, we will actually do for loop. 
So one thing that I need to know, I need to know how many elements do I have in this product, or how many elements do I have in this array. array. So I'm just going to say, well, okay, n is length of x, length. If you do size, uh, let me give you an example. So let's say that I x is something like this. Okay. If you do size of x, then you have <coughs> 1 by 20. Okay. So that's why I don't want to use size. Then I have to pick one of those. And length just gives me the length of the array when it's a 1D array. So you have to be a little careful with size. Okay, and then I'm going to say, uh-huh, for i is equal to 1 to n. Don't you have to initialize the Yes. I wanted to have that as a question. Okay. Point well taken, I need to initialize the product. But I'm going to first compute this immediate, uh, sort of like intermediate product, or maybe I can call it pi which is just simply i times x of i. And if I want product of all of them, let me just quickly remind you what we're doing. Okay. Product of all of them, so I have to have 1 times x of 1, times 2, times x of 2, times 3, times x of 3, and so forth. So this is my intermediate product for every i. I have to actually do a product of all of them. So I need to initialize my product before coming into the loop. I cannot initialize with 0 because this is not a sum. It's a product. If I do 0, then 0 times anything will be 0. So I have nothing to compute. So products I'll have to initialize with 1. Sums I initialize with 0. Products I initialize with 1. And then all I need to do is say, OK, product is my previous value of product times this intermediate product pi. And that's it. Could you have just done yes. product? So I could have just, instead of having pi here, do i times x of i. That's a matter of style. <coughs> and that's essentially it. At the end of this product is computed. And that's what I'm passing to the outside. So from the outside, let's actually now execute. So from the outside, in order to execute the function, I have to do input parameters. So I can't just run here or just type my product. If I say my product, okay, it's going to yell at me because I didn't give it input parameters. The whole point is to have a function that will execute for different types of inputs. So I have to create myself an input. And I already did that. Is this good enough, or do we want something different? So that's good enough. So if I actually just say product is my product of x, this is just going to be the entire product of all of the elements. Now, the question that I posed actually says, uh-uh, you got to actually stop if this product is too large. Too large being larger than 10,000, right? So this is just product of everybody. How do I stop? The break. So I'm going to, inside, I'm going to say here, if my product is larger than 10,000, simply break, and that will be end end. And that will actually finish the loop right there. Up. Oh, command window. Thank you. 
Okay? So now if I execute this again, my product is the first number that went over 10,000. Minor difference here would be, huh? For, uh, and why can't I use numal x? You could. It's fine too. Yeah. Okay. So another, I could actually have number of elements, that works too. So either length or no, number of elements. Both are very handy, remember them. Okay, so this is using for function and a break. Okay. Is there a way we could do this? So this is version one. How did I get one? Like when I didn't have a break. Oh. Okay. So I went stage by stage to show the difference with and without the break. Now I could also do this with a while. And then version one. I'm actually now going to complete, <coughs> comment everything here. Now I'm going to write version 2. So I'm going to initialize my product as 1. Who can offer me how to do this with a while function? With a while loop. So what does while loop mean? Cool, so what is the condition here? I want the loop to stop when it's over 10,000. So what should be my file? File well, product is or equal to 10,000. So let's do that. So while product is less than or equal to 10,000 and and now I would like to keep growing this product, right? right? So I actually now need something to iterate through elements of the vector. Okay. So basically, I'm going to say my i is equal to 1 to begin with. So I'm going to say, aha, uh -huh, product is equal to product, my previous product, times i times x of i. And since this is not the for loop, my i will not automatically increment, so I now have to increment my i, my counter. My i otherwise while doesn't increment anything. You have to do it. But the four one does. Too. Four one does. Okay. So when you say four, okay. For i is equal to this is actually a vector of values. Oh, okay. So i just goes down those values, whatever those values are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I guess, I guess. So they could have been something like this. They could have been a hundred minus five, one. Okay. That can be part of a for loop as well. So anything goes as long as it works as a vector. But here, I don't have. So while will not increment anything on its own, you actually have to do it. So basically, this counter that keeps going and taking bigger and bigger elements of x, I have to keep incrementing myself. So this is the for loop. Is this all? Do I need to check on anything else? Huh? Like you have line with display text and display all the rest, so that's what we did on the last one. We could display it to check things. So let's actually see something. Um, let's actually now execute this with our old one, if that works. 
It works. But let me now give myself a different x. I'm just going to divide values of the previous ones by a thousand. Yeah. So let's now, so my new x is slightly smaller in values. Uh oh. What happened? It's not infinite, but I try to reach elements of x that don't exist. Okay? Because I didn't guard against it. Yeah, I didn't check how many elements of x. So now let's actually, so now I'm thinking, okay, well, what's wrong? And let's say I'm here smarty pants because I know what's wrong. But let me say, well, okay, maybe if I don't know what's wrong, I'm just going to uncomment these, okay, and see what's printed. Where am I now? Oops. So what happened here, product is relatively small because all of the numbers are small. So it's never actually going to exceed 10,000. Okay? And I will not get out of the loop. And it's trying to access on the next go element 21 that doesn't exist. Size of my x is 20. Okay? And that's a problem. So that's the index that exceeds matrix dimension. Ma matrix being x. So any arrays are referred to as x. Is everybody clear what went wrong here? It was I went I tried to go over x. Right. So in my while loop, I did not guard against that, so I have to be a little more careful. So here, okay, I need another condition. Yeah, I'm sorry, can you explain again what went So here, okay. Printed product, which was something times 10 to the minus 4, and then it printed this as 21. So on the next execution of the loop, it tried to access x of 21. x of 21 does not exist. I have array that has 20 elements. Okay. So you have array that is defined. The moment you're trying, you're out of bounds of the defined memory. And those, those errors are called segmentation problems, like you went overboard. And here it complains to you that index index exceeds matrix dimensions, meaning this dimension of array x. Okay. You tried to get x of twenty one and that didn't work. Yes. So if you had like uh, your array went to twenty five, you could get one more calculation. Yes. So if my array Let's actually have a double bigger one. Let's say that this is my array. So now I have 40. Okay? So if I execute, it's going to do that at 41. So the moment I'm out. In our very initial case, where I had very large numbers, that product went over 10,000. So I went out of the loop before I actually reached this case. The point that I'm making here is that often to find all of the mistakes that you actually had in your program, you have to have multiple tests. And even with all of, you know, if you do multiple tests, you do five to ten, you're not going to do all of them ever. So always be open to the possibility that you had a mistake in there that you had to fix. <laughs> that possibility is always open for you. Yes? Um, so it's just, um, so I guess, Yes. 
Well, that's just because that's the first large number of products previous. So if you print them all, your previous product will be, so your X was pretty large numbers of printables. Okay. Okay. So it's going to, on the next iteration, so product became large, and then it caught it as larger as 10,000. So try to print the previous product. I don't, I, don't, I don't have a previous product. All right, so his question is, let's say that I have something like this. Okay. Your question is, why is product so large? Because my last term that I multiplied with here was pretty large itself as well. So the product just before that was less than 10,000. So product on the previous iteration was 1,600. And then the next one, it went over 10,000 big time. Okay? So that's very hard. OK. All right, so let's now fix this. I'm going to say and my i is less than or equal to length or number of elements of x. Professor, why is it that I don't get that error message? Because I changed x. Which is 1 and? Oh, so here you don't get it because you this went sooner than you reached more than 20 elements of x. So how, what, what did you change that made it? The so divide your x's by 1,000, and then try it again. And then you'll get that problem. Yes. OK. Did you run my product of x? have to give it input parameters. This function doesn't run without input parameters. Yes. Um, so well, so it's just about sitting in the No, they're the doubling the effort. Technically, yes, but that would be doing things twice as complex as Okay, so now if I put this in, so there was a problem here, some of you, if you didn't, if you just said my product, okay, this is not a script, it's a function. Function has input parameters and I have to run it with input parameters, otherwise it doesn't know what x is, I didn't give it x. Important. Script is just a collection of anything that runs everything for me. Function is something that I have to change the input parameter and always give it a different one. Now, technically, could you define a function without input parameters? Yes, you could. Okay. But this one, as is, has x as an input parameter. Therefore, you cannot run it correctly without providing it with x. Get the error message out. Okay, what did I what did I do now? Not enough input arguments, okay? Oh, yeah. So if I now actually do this, it's gonna get out and I can even run it with that this. Okay. So I can even run it with that smaller x when I divide them over by thousands, so I never hit the ten thousand. What does not enough input argument mean? You define your function to have an input parameter. Then you run it without an input parameter. So that means that you don't have enough input parameters. You ran the function without anything. What is x? This is input argument or input parameter. 
if I run this function without any, I ran it with zero input arguments. Therefore, I don't have enough input arguments. But do you define your input argument? No, you don't. That's the point of a function. I didn't define x inside. Okay? I didn't. Therefore, I don't know what x is when I come down to evaluate x. I don't know what x is. So this is the important part of function. Okay? I define it as having x. If I don't give it x, it doesn't know what to do. It needs x here. Okay? If it doesn't have that x, it cannot operate. And it's telling you that it does not have enough input arguments. All right, so which one of these two ways you might find easier to think through? For loop or a while loop? For loop. Wow. Yeah, most people do. While is cleaner when you kind of think it through and write it down. It's a little more elegant sometimes, but like actually, uh, break might be, so these breaks might be a little difficult to see within the program. Here, it's immediately clear when I'm going to get out of the loop. Okay, my conditions are right here. Whereas when they're hidden inside the code, it could be difficult to see if you have too many of them. It can, it could get messy. Okay, in while loop, you're immediately seeing what are the conditions that you actually have to meet for the loop to run. So those are the benefits of while loop. So in terms of writing the program, it's easier to run a full loop. Sometimes it's just going to be difficult to define what is the end of that for loop, because you have to give it an end. Okay? And in those cases, you will have to go with while loop. All right. So this was basically a review of all of the types of loops. And this is actually a great segue into our new topic. So we already had examples here where we had to find what is wrong with the program. Finding what is wrong with the program is called debugging. Okay. And to have less debugging, you should organize your code well. Okay? So basically, whenever you're writing a code, you will design it. For that, actually writing things on a piece of paper might be helpful, just to figure out what my problem is. What should be my functions? What should be my input parameters, output parameters, and so forth? Okay? Then you remove all of the errors. And then you test the code, and that's what I was doing by trying it out for different x's just a moment ago. And doing the whole whole process, actually, it might take a moment. Okay. So it's good to actually have certain good practices. So let's actually see what those are. First thing is you want to actually have code that is organized okay, and visually consistent. That doesn't always happen on the first writing. So the moment you're like just trying things out and write, typing things up, it might not be the prettiest code, but you kind of go back to it and organize it afterwards. So for instance, you might consider the following struct. Whoops. First you say this is function y is my function of x. Then you put what we call a prologue. You describe your inputs, outputs, and the purpose of the function. Then you take something, possibly this x is not in some format that you would like it to be, so you might need to process it. If you remember in your homework, reading in that humongous file where you had to get rid of some 21 lines at the beginning of the file, that's processing your input. So that would go first, and possibly you need to verify something in that input. And then once you're done with that, then you can actually compute something. Okay? So that comes later. 
Then you have a primary computational task, whatever it is that you're tasked. Maybe you we were computing permeability, porosity, plotting porosity, finding where the shale is with the Gri values over 140 and so forth. And then you prepare output and basically define this y and send it out of the function. So this is a good design that kind of does things in an organized way. If you start mixing these up, can you mix it up? Yes, you can. Okay. But if you're going to process input only partially, then compute one part of it, then process another part of it, and then, descri then discover that actually you didn't process it correctly, it kind of becomes messy to find where the error was. Okay. Was it while computing something, or was it while reading it? So you might want to consider being compartmentalized like this. Okay. Visual appearance of a code is important. What did this code do? Defines the matrix and then does what? Prints it out, right? And prints it out first row by row. Right? Then all of the elements in one row, it does the next line at the end of the row, and then it keeps going. And so this is something that we did with the matrix A and everything. What does this code do? Same thing. Is it easier to spot what is this code doing or this? So here comes your good programming practice. If you're going to be trying to find out where the error was, then it's clear. This code is clear. This, basically, I have indentation. So I start with the outside for loop. Next one, I indent a little. So I actually see immediately that I have a nested loop. Okay, it's easier to spot it. Whereas here, it's a little more difficult to spot the nested loop. Does everybody see this? See this? So this nested loop is a difficult to spot visually in this code as opposed to this one. So some of this, where do you put the white space, next line, things like those, those are personal preference. Okay. But it's good to put some indentation, some space in between the variables, and in the, at least the, the loops that you have in your program, try to indent. Them to see how many layers they have. Yes? Do you think it's helpful to capitalize comments or not? Up to you. Yeah. It's important to comment, though. Right. So that's definitely important. <clears throat> so basically, I would throw in a small comment here, like reading in the variables, right? Then doing whatever it is, you know, computing porosity, computing permeability, computing this, computing that, and then at the end, sending things out. Again, just imagine yourself reading your own code two years later. And I can tell you from experience that I look at some of my code and I'm like, uh, I wrote this. <laughs> Who is this person writing messy code and not commenting enough? Okay. So again, it's a little bit of work. But that work is good because you can go back to it much easier. And if you're sharing the code with somebody else, then it's easier for that person to follow. Okay. Second thing is like when you're writing the code quickly, oh, my first variable that I think of will be A, then the second one will be B, then the second one will be C, and then I'm going to run out of the names and I'm going to start going to like A1, B1, C1, okay? Looking at that later, what does that physically mean, A, B, C? It's a good idea to actually give some relatively short name, but the name that is meaningful. Okay, so it's, there's a balance in there as well. But basically, this would be inner diameter, as opposed to just B. <laughs> Thickness, inner radius, outside radius, things like those. Okay. So give yourself a hint what is your variable about. And then it's a very good idea to put a comment saying, like, full name of the variable, and also any... any uh, Oh, is this radius in meters, millimeters? What, are, what do you expect this input? Okay. 
So think about the physical parameters as well. Okay. Documentation is pre pretty much writing in a, enough comments so you know and can follow what the code does. So comments can be anywhere. Comments can be within the code on in all spots. So here I would write initialize the product. Okay. I can ha have here main loop. Okay. <coughs> I can also put the comment after. Okay, so I can say increment the counter. So comments can go in. Now, the moment I introduce a comment, I'm done for that line. I cannot put more code after this one. <laughs> so any comments are always ignored by the program. They're just there for humans. So here's an example. This is a beautiful way to write down function prolog. Synopsis is the ways I can call this function. This function obviously will be overloaded, so I will be able to call it in multiple different ways. Okay. So these are the three possible forms. These are my inputs. It could be either temperature. All of them are optional. Because if I don't input, apparently the function is well equipped, so it will define something instead of me. That's why it says it's optional. Temperature at which density is evaluated, and there's a default value that will be written for me if I didn't. So this will be defined for me. And this will also avoid those problems not enough input arguments. Okay? Because there is a way to define function for, for multiple types of units. And then you have units. You can put C for Celsius and for Fahrenheit. If you don't put anything, Fahrenheit will be assumed. Okay. And output is row, and it's giving you also what units in which case. Okay. And in notes, you can actually see what this is further documentation. And this was actually typing up something. And once you think about your thermodynamics course and the number of tables you want to do there, you can actually go and program yourself. This is the table from page such and such in the thermodynamics book. Here's the, so you give yourself further documentation that is not necessarily with the code, but you know where to go to for more information. So this is the ideal way. Is this something that you write immediately when you start writing the function? You first write the function, go debug it, and then, but you do it while you're fresh, okay? But not immediately. The first go, you're first trying to figure out how to program the function correctly. Likewise, on your test, I will not expect you to write all this, okay? But just think now, because that's wasting the time on the test. But, in general, good practice would require you go back to it and kind of make it nice and easy for you to refer to later. So on homework, I suggest that you actually do this practice if you're not super pressed for time. Okay? On your project, yes, this will be required. Project assuming that you have a little have more time. Project. Yeah, there will be a project at the end of the class. That will take two weeks to complete. Hmm? <laughs> okay, there, there we go. <laughs> there, okay. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> All right. So basically, logical pro process here is you plan your solution, what are you going to do? You divide your program in units. For certain, you can write that first function line, and on the test, it will get some point on that. 
you definitely read that correctly all the time. Then you translate whatever solution you came up with into MATLAB code, and you have to test the code at the end. That's what we were doing by trying those X's a moment ago. Okay? So don't expect to write a perfect code immediately. Okay. So, well, stepwise refinement refer to start working on something and figure out how to do things and then incrementally add things up. Again, that's where a piece of paper could be useful to plan the solution before you just actually don't expect yourself just to write everything down. So, expect trying things out and refining as you go. All right. Now, whether you're going to use one file or multiple is a matter of design and it's your choice. I prefer having one function in one file. You could have sub function in the same file, but then you cannot call those sub functions in other okay, outside of that file. So if you have multiple functions in one file, the second and so forth are called sub functions, okay, and they are valid or known only within that file and not outside. I personally prefer one function per one file, and all of the so one function will see all of the other functions in the same folder without a problem. So if I have okay, so so far, using numel. This is a function, another function that is called within my function. Now, this is a MATLAB function, so whenever I open MATLAB, I will know all of the MATLAB functions. If none of was actually something that I defined, it would have to be in this directory, or otherwise I would have to tell MATLAB where it is. Okay. So I prefer, if I have a second function, I have two options. I can define that function later within the function. Within the function that's wow. called sub functions. Or I can open another file and define yeah. it in a separate okay. file. That's my preferred mode, one function per file. Okay. But any functions that I defined here below, I would not be able to use outside of this file. Or you should like combine all the files if they don't need. You just keep them in the same folder. So the moment if I do, don't do anything here, okay? I have a whole lot of MATLAB. So this break loop we did last time, add mult we did two, three times ago. I can call them from here. I know about them. So any function that I define in that folder, I, I know about and I can use. Okay. Also any MATLAB function. So normal is a MATLAB function, so it's not. Now, even if you're in a different folder, there's a way that's called add path. So you can add path to that folder and tell MATLAB how to find that function. Okay? So you could organize your code into multiple folders if, that, if it's getting large. So that's, again, up to you how many different functions and how are you going to solve. Okay. Now, debugging. There are basic debugging tools, and one of them I exemplified a moment ago. I basically just printed all of the intermediate steps in a while ago. So I just let them be printed. That's the simplest way. Okay. Another way could be that you can actually define a breakpoint and I literally, in MATLAB, click here. Okay. And then when I execute, my function will stop where I put the breakpoint. Okay. So here where I stop, I could now inquire what's going on. I can say, what is i? Did it print i? i is 1. Okay. What is x of i? 0 0.02. Okay. Then I can say continue, db cont, debug continue. 
next time it arrives at that spot, this is a loop, so I'm going to keep getting to that spot. I can get now say, oh, now i is 2. What is now x of i? Great. What is product right now? Oh, okay, cool. Okay. So I can actually, I could also say just db next. Whoa, hi. Uh, db step. Apologies. So then it's just gonna step <coughs> by one command, okay? So this is my next command in line 27. DB next. And then I can also simply say DB quit. And I'm gonna debug. This is a debugging command. If you want to know more about it, so this is what I'm going to show you as the simplest way to debug. Again, the simplest way would be simply to print everything. If I don't want to do that, I and if I want to turn off this, I just turn it off. So click on it, on, off, on, off. Okay. If you want to know more, then you can either do help db step. And when you, you will actually see now all of the possible functions that you could use here. Okay, so I'll leave that up to you. Hmm? So you define yourself a little. So you just click on something where you want to. That's the simplest way. <laughs> And then you just run. You just call the function and run your code. There is in textbook to open up the book. There is in textbook to open up the Okay, just go and practice. And try to write them on a piece of paper and a map. So a little bit of both because ultimately you will have to write it down on the paper. So you have to be confident in that. No. I cannot stop computers from communicating. It's also Right. So going through the process of stopping computers because right now math lab is holding on and it works if I can take you all into the room the computers. I cannot control your computers and the computers we have here in the department. There's not enough of them, so... Oh, Steven, 